this week. Going out without getting too close. Dressing Lara without going to the shops. And cheering on your team without going to the match. Welcome, welcome. Come on in. Welcome to Click. Lara's here as well. Welcome. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good, thanks. Although I had a bit of an incident filming and I'm covered in glitter. So anybody with a good TV set may be able to see that and you'll find out why later. But anyway, how are you, Spencer? <laughs> Right, I'm fine, thanks. Uh, this week I've been trying out some stuff that might help you if you sat around the house using a phone or a tablet or a laptop more than usual. There's a lot of that going on at the moment if you hadn't noticed. So if you're using a phone or a tablet and you're sick of holding it up all the time, I'm trying this, it's called the Slick Pillow Stand. It's a thick bit of rubber and you slot your device in there like that and then you strap it around a pillow or a cushion so you can rest it on your lap like that. You can even pop it into bed, lie next to it and check your work emails late at night, if that's your thing. Now, if you're using a laptop on a dining table or on your lap or in bed, you'll know that that is terrible for your back or your neck. So I finally got around to getting myself one of these. It's an adjustable laptop stand, plenty of them on the market. You can see that the legs adjust in all different ways. So you can pop it over your lap and you can adjust the height. So the keyboard, the screen and the camera are at the right height. This comes with a USB powered fan to keep things cool as well. And if you happen to be working from a really strange place like your sofa and you need a completely adjustable work surface, it turns out they have the perfect solution. It is called the iRonin board and I have it here. Would you like to see it? Yeah, I'd love to. Okay, right, so ready? Here we go. It's the, the iRonin board, as you can see. It goes all the way up. Oh, Spencer. All the way down, brilliant, <laughs> perfect. I'll tell you what, it also comes with um, this thing. I don't know what it is, but the processor runs incredibly hot. <laughs> Well, you've certainly been resourceful at home, but in the outside world, non-essential retail is due to open next week. And Spencer, I can't believe I'm talking to you seriously right now, but <laughs> would you really want to go clothes shopping? You know I hate clothes shopping at the best of times. Yes, that is a very good point. And I think for most people, it's probably not going to be a priority right now. But of course, the economy is weeping. So are we going to get the high street back in fashion? Clearly, it's going to be challenging for stores, and for those who do visit, the experience will be different. Technology can't replace everything, but it's been doing a decent job of filling the gap over the past months. Go in Store's been working with a number of shops, using live video streaming to show products. Its live video chat allows customers to connect with in-store staff over the web. In fact, when Curry's PC World, a UK-based technology retailer, first began using it in April, it realised it could bring back some of its furloughed staff and allow them to work from home. But now they are starting to come back in-store. A lot of the customers are loving this, especially, as I said earlier, the people who are shielding or are vulnerable people or people who are homeschooling their kids, especially like they're all very grateful, you know, being able to speak to a person rather than just browsing on the Internet and looking for answers on 20 different websites. They can just come down to the Curry Species World website and click on the shop like button and get advice from a person either in store or from their home. An innovative remote solution, and it brings a new element to online shopping, especially for those who might be isolating longer. But when it comes to clothes shopping, buying online does have limitations. Over the years on Click, we've looked at some attempted solutions to getting the sizing right. I tried to get measured up by the Zozo suit and some smart leggings, both connecting to smartphone apps to take readings. And Spencer tried out some different looks in this smart mirror. But maybe now is the moment for some of these kinds of ideas. One platform has taken things to a whole new level, making you, the customer, the model. 
AI-powered app ZKit aims to give you a really true-to-life virtual experience of trying on clothes. Now, it does this by first of all photographing you. You do really have to follow the instructions. And that involved this rather embarrassing attire, a combination of shorts, a tank top and my best shoes. First time I put on heels in three months. Otherwise, the picture may not upload very well and I did have some difficulty with pictures of my own that I thought would work. So once I got the picture uploaded and I did feel like I was dressed like a 16 year old, it was really quite incredible because it offered something that no store does. I'm flicking through the catalogue and I'm seeing every single outfit on me. So it means that you can actually pick out the things that suit you rather than just picking out the items that catch your eye. How does it do it? Well, its algorithm uses deep learning to scan the picture of the clothing, dividing it into 80,000 segments. It then does the same to the picture of the person and from there can match up the two to fit the clothes to anyone's unique body shape. Something that's always been a big problem for online retailers is the issue of so many returns. And right now, that can involve the quarantining of clothes as well. Plus, for the customer, do you really want to be spending a long time in a socially distanced post office queue? Well, some of these outfits definitely look more ridiculous than others, but of course, there's only any point in any of this if what we're looking at here is actually true to life. So I need to order something to see if it looks the same in the flesh. I'm going to go for this dress. It looks nice there. Looks okay. So I'm now going to tap through to buy it. Okay, the parcel is here. Let's do this. Doesn't feel great, admittedly. Let's see how it looks. Ta-da! Okay, I am actually pretty amazed by how much this looks like the virtual image. Let me just stand in the right position. So if we get a photo of that, put in a white background and match it up, then we can really see the true likeness. And I think that is quite astonishing. The only thing that I hadn't bargained for is that there's glitter absolutely everywhere. So I may have got a great idea in advance of how it was going to look, but it's not until you get your hands on something you can really tell the quality. Although, in fairness to this, it is a 20 quid dress. And actually the inspiration came uh, actually from a very different world, from uh, military-related technologies. We used to develop mapping technology, so you could actually see how maps uh, look on topographies like intelligence maps, look on topographies and when we developed those technologies we actually had a kind of a eureka moment that actually the human body is a little bit like a topography and any clothing items picture we can look at it as if it was an intelligence map and apply more or less the same technologies and by that to solve the holy grail of online fashion. So whilst many of us are starting to be able to go back to the high street, it seems coronavirus could have dramatically changed the way we shop long term. We think high streets will, will persist, but we are uh, under no illusion that you know, the number of retail units will probably decrease. So there's forecasts that said by 2025 we'd lose 25% of retail stock. We think that might have been accelerated and we're, we're looking at a sort of one to two year horizon instead of uh, a five year one. So perhaps the new reality is that our ever-improving online shopping experience is increasingly at odds with the idea of getting back to the buzzing high street. I tell you what, after years of trying these sorts of things that claim to show you what clothes will look like on you, this one does seem to have worked. I mean, that virtual you in the dress really did look like the real you in the real dress. Yeah, I was actually pretty impressed. Tell you what, though, I am a real stickler for clothes being comfortable when they're on and I don't think an app will ever be able to tell you that. True, I'm not sure that it's my first priority although I don't like things to be too tight around the stomach because I want to be able to eat <laughs> but also the feel of the fabric you do sometimes want to really touch it. Yeah absolutely absolutely. Okay so last week we talked about the next generation of the Xbox video games console. PlayStation were due to launch the PS5 last week too but they delayed one week later, and Mark Chislak has some information. After months of hype and feverish online speculation, the most popular video games console in the world, the PlayStation 4, is about to be replaced. With, you guessed it, the PlayStation 5. 
There's a lot of hype around this PlayStation event because PlayStation's next generation console is still shrouded in mystery. It is the follow up to one of the biggest selling consoles of all time. And yet it's coming out at the end of this year and we still don't know what it looks like or what games we're going to be able to play on it. Sony's managed to sell 104 million PlayStation 4s, making it the second best selling console of all time, beaten only by its older sibling, the PlayStation 2, with 150 million consoles shifted. So this next machine has big shoes to fill, but right now gaming is having something of a moment. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown, millions of people have found themselves at home looking for ways to entertain themselves. Playing video games is one of those ways. Gaming has proved so popular that there's been a 48% increase in console sales. Today's reveal for the PlayStation 5 differs from the usual noisy affair attended by thousands of members of the press, becoming an online-only event, finally allowing us to see the actual PS5 itself. A curvy console that will come in two flavours, a standard machine with an Ultra HD Blu-ray drive and a digital edition which lacks the drive. Of course, Sony showcased fan favourite games like Spider-Man, this time around an expansion on the 2018 title, now starring Miles Morales. And we got a taste of racing game Gran Turismo 7, which now features a story mode. And more third-person adventuring with mechanised animals in a far future USA, in a new Horizon title, Forbidden West. The latest Ratchet and Clank game showed off the speed of the PS5 solid state drive, virtually eliminating load times, creating vast play areas that do away with programming tricks like ledges and narrow gaps the player must squeeze through. These are clever ways of allowing the console to load the next area without the player noticing. The SSD is so fast here it does away with this programming sleight of hand. But surely there's more to this next generation than shinier visuals and load times. I think this next generation isn't just about better graphics, it's actually about your experience as a gamer. They're trying to remove some of the barriers between the point where you want to play a game and the point where you're actually playing that game. Cutting down on loading times, cutting down on the time it takes for the game to download if you're going to do it digitally, the time it takes for the updates to install, all of that is being torn away so you have access to a game within seconds of wanting to play it. The console wars of old are set to continue as the rival Xbox Series X machine is also scheduled to launch this year too. Both machines will be backwards compatible, being able to play games designed for the previous generation's hardware, the Xbox One and PS4. But Sony and Microsoft have so far remained tight-lipped about how much either of these consoles will cost, a factor which will become increasingly important in an uncertain economic environment. And while gaming is popular right now, some people might choose to stick with the console they already have. Consumers will be able to make up their own minds which machine they prefer when both consoles arrive towards the end of this year. Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. It was the week that Google Maps added a new COVID-19 alert feature in selected countries, including the UK and the US, to help people plan trips around restrictions. Fast Brick Robotics robot Hadrian X was shown breaking its own speed record for laying bricks, up to 200 per hour. And aesthetics company Next Motion announced it's developing what it says is the world's first aesthetic injection robot to operate independently to provide treatments. It was also the week that IBM announced it would no longer offer, develop, or research general facial recognition technology. In a letter to US Congress, the company said it firmly opposes use of any technology for mass surveillance or racial profiling. Amazon then put a one-year ban on the use of its recognition product by the police, and Microsoft said it would not sell its facial recognition tech to the police until federal regulations were in place. Remote doctor app Babylon Health acknowledged it suffered a data breach after one of its users found they had access to dozens of video recordings of other patients' consultations. Babylon said it has now fixed the issue and notified regulators. Retailer Gap has bought 73 warehouse robots to help with demand created by online orders. These sort picking robots can pick 335 pieces per hour. 
And finally this week, we saw a new cable-driven robot that can be used to interact with and track flying insects. Researchers say the lab on cables allows them to successfully match the movement of bugs in flight, allowing them to study them untethered. So earlier, Lara talked about the alternatives to going to physical shops, but there are sometimes situations where you do want to visit a store or maybe a tourist attraction. And then of course, the main worry is staying a safe distance from the other visitors. So how about this? Visitors to Florence Cathedral in Italy are now being asked to wear something extra as they admire its famous dome. These devices use ultra-wideband radio signals to judge how far away each is from the others. If a visitor to the cathedral or to the museum uh, inadvertently draws too near someone else, uh, the light that here you see absolutely still will suddenly begin to move and there will be an audible sensation, a kind of uh, buzz. Meanwhile, this gallery in New York State is planning to use the same device to allow its visitors to lose themselves in its artworks without wandering into others who are similarly absorbed. We wanted to make sure uh, that people could have an extra hand and a little bit of help to actually feel more comfortable in the space and to focus on the art as much as possible uh, instead of actually constantly being uh, terrorized in a way by safety measures. Also, another feature that is very important for us is the possibility to program them so that we can host groups up to six people all together and avoid the devices to actually ring among each other to host uh, families and uh, groups. Similar devices have now been produced, all in an effort to allow gym members, hotel guests and school pupils to mix at a safe distance in their respective environments. This nudge tactic is already a hit at the De Croc Library in Belgium. It's not a big deal, it's just an extra step in, in entering the library. It's easy to use because you are not really using it actively. But yeah, it, it helps you uh, be aware of your surroundings. And the advantage of a decentralized device is that no personal data is stored anywhere. Because we can give that immediate feedback, we do not need to store anything. We do not need to, we do not need to log any personal information. We don't, do not need to send any data to a backend or the internet or a gateway or whatever. Um, it's, it's a completely privacy-proof solution that can really help supporting social distancing in the moment itself. But collecting some data isn't always a bad idea. As well as helping shoppers avoid each other, these neckbands could help shops plan to keep customers apart. When Bunk's adopted by retailers, it gives them a, a lot of insight into how their store's laid out, um, where the, the hot spots are, if you like, where people are coming into, into close contact with each other. So, it's enabling the retailer to change the layouts of the, of the aisles of how people browse, whether it be clothes or electricals, based on real data rather than um, assumptions. There are places, though, that can only reopen accepting the fact that people do have to be more closely packed together, like sporting events, and that's why they're happening behind closed doors. Yeah, with fans not being able to go to matches, everyone loses out. It's not good for the fans, it's not good for the players who can't then hear the fans' support. Now, Paul Carter has been looking at this and we'll hear all about it in a second after we say, hello, Paul, how Hi, have you Paul. been? Hey, Spen, hey, Lara, I'm, I'm all right, thanks. I'm uh, clinging to what little bit of sanity I had left before <laughs> all this started, but yeah, I'm, I'm doing all right. What have you been up to? Uh, well, you know, we're used to travelling a lot on this show and that's obviously out of the window at the moment. So I've been throwing myself into the virtual world rather than the, the real world. I've been playing a lot of PS4, um, <laughs> mainly spending my time completing Final Fantasy VII and Red Dead Redemption 2. Oh, sounds fun. Well, I'm glad to hear that you've been busy. Let's talk sport. What is it that you've been looking at? Football. And I'm delighted to say I can finally say football is coming home. And that's because games are going to be played behind closed doors for the foreseeable future. And at home is the only place most of us are actually going to be able to watch any. 
So to make the stadiums feel a little bit less, well, empty, clubs and broadcasters have been trying some tech-based solutions to try and make things seem a little bit more atmospheric. Around the world, football is slowly returning, albeit to mostly empty stadiums. In Denmark, the season restarted at the end of May. To try and create some sort of atmosphere in what have been dubbed ghost games, Superliga club Aarhus created a 40 metre virtual grandstand. We knew that we couldn't have spectators during the first games, so we needed to uh, somehow recreate this community. And I must say it worked out very well. Actually, at some point it was very moving. Uh, the first game where we had it, we had a very late equaliser, very important goal, and I looked up on this big screen. And I saw an elderly couple and the woman was standing and cheering and then she turned around and kissed her husband who was still sitting. So those intimate moments we, we, we get the chance to see because we got the opportunity to come straight home to the fans. And we also uh, had a camera uh, under the, the screen so if the players wanted they could run out and cheer and then the fans could, could see them. Also in Denmark, League leaders FC Midtjylland turned their stadium into a drive-in. Fans were able to watch the games on screens erected in the car parks with commentary on their car radios. They lost 1-0 though, so it may have been a long drive home. Elsewhere, one company are taking the concept of virtual fans a step further. Oz Sports created a solution offering supporters the chance to appear inside the stadium as avatars using mixed reality. So we have people that they can sign up from their homes, they can pick their avatar, they can put on like uh, their favorite jersey for the most favorite club, they can pick a seat in the stadium, and we bring them in a new parallel universe that is mixed with the broadcast. So the director of the broadcast that is taking decisions on switching cameras, etc., sees an augmented version of the of the mats and maybe they can see a great moment where someone in the stadium is doing something fun maybe doing the dance of the favorite club or cheering or something and they would like to zoom into that and to just to bring you know energy back into the game to show that there are there are people out there that are cheering for the club etc <laughs> sky sports revealed this week that they're going to be using crowd noise from the game fifa 20 for their english premier league broadcasts the stands might not be full, but they'll sound like they are with Sky Sports crowds. While BT Sport have been experimenting during their Bundesliga coverage by playing relevant crowd noise over match events. Both broadcasters will be offering the crowd noise as a choosable option for their customers. In Spain, La Liga have begun using a similar solution. So, is using tech to be the 12th man an absolute worldie of an idea? Or are they having a proverbial stinker? Well, I'm generally the one who dislikes fakery wherever it happens. However, and on this occasion, I'm all for it. Absolutely, 100%. I mean, the idea of you know putting you know, people on Zoom around as they do in the, the, the Danish clubs, and particularly our house, that for me is fabulous in every way imaginable. That is fabulous. It's the closest thing you can possibly get to the real thing. More clubs and broadcasters are expected to reveal other tech solutions as the restarted season progresses. Though, if you're anything like me, no tech will ever be the real thing. That was Paul. And that's it for this week. You can find us throughout the week on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at BBC Click. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you soon. Bye. Bye bye. We'll